It's been two weeks since my total hysterectomy, complete hysterectomy. I've been going through a variety of emotions, one of them that may surprise you, and my progress, and the pathology report came back. Let's go down that road. Hello, faithful people. I'm Orlean. I'm Gary. And welcome to our channel, Roads of Faith. Our channel is typically about living full-time in an RV. We've been living in our RV for almost seven years now. Uh, but some changes came back in March when I had two scans done. And we suspected endometrial carcinoma. Two weeks ago, I had a total hysterectomy plus blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember what all the words are, but what happened was they took my uterus that had the mass in it, my cervix, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, and six lymph nodes. It was done laparoscopically at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. It was done in the morning, and I came home that afternoon. I can put up the first week uh, update after my one week of the surgery and everything, uh, at, either at the link up above or at the end of this video. So you can take a look at that and see maybe how far I've come in a week's time. I wanna talk a little bit about some of the emotions I've been going through. Hasn't been too bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been very tolerable and been very pleased with the progress. Yeah. Not too many uh, rants or raves or anything. Normal. No. <laughs> okay. Normal. All right. I'll go with that. Well, one of the emotions that I was going through was frustration. Uh, and disappointment in me because of circumstances where I was not able to get myself in condition before surgery. Now we're in pretty good health most of the time, but when we were in Corpus Christi, I went through a lot of dental work and we had some air quality issues while we were in Corpus Christi because of agricultural burns in Mexico. It was just a lot of things. Uh, Gary had caught a cold. I was trying to stay away from him, but I think the dental work put me over the edge and and really um, knocked my immune system down. So I, I wasn't at my top and I wasn't able to get out and do the walking that I wanted to do. I wasn't able to do a lot of things that I wanted to do to get ready for my surgery. I think that would have helped with some things. Stress is hard. Uh it takes a toll and uh, when you can't release it with some activities and normal things that we would do you just have to be sick and go to a dentist and open your mouth and ugh, a lot of stress then worrying and waiting yeah that too waiting for the appointments and everything else to happen stress is a big factor and I was trying to release a lot of that and I was just trying to get physically better in in shape too but that didn't happen, so I was frustrated and I was disappointed that I wasn't able to get those things done. Um, in the long run, I guess I'm doing pretty well, considering, mm -hmm. but it just it was just frustrating that I couldn't do that. I, I highly recommend that if you are gonna be having any kind of surgery, that you do some things to be proactive at making your healing go faster. On top of all the things that we are going through in Corpus Christi, then we moved to Houston and the day after we got here I had an unplanned CT scan. Um, I talked about that in my last video about what prompted that. It was something I saw in a report that troubled me and I talked to the doctor about it and so she ordered a CT scan. Uh, the CT scan came back good. We didn't know for a day and a half the results, but that came back very good. There was no cancer found um, anywhere outside the uterus, so that was wonderful. 
but it was one more thing and it was a lot of chemicals oh my gosh mm -hmm. I had three different dyes put in me that day for the CT scan. And then the day of the surgery, I think I counted in the reports at least probably 20 different drugs that were put into me. It, wow, it's no wonder it took a little bit to get some of that worked out. And to top it all off, the night before my surgery, I couldn't get to sleep. I wonder why. Hmm. And I got three hours of sleep. I made up for two hours on the operating table, but <laughs> it just was not good that I didn't get a good night's sleep before. So that would have probably helped too. I think all those things that happened, all accumulation and every of all of that just really is not me. And getting through all of those things that I'm not normally going through. You know, I don't, we don't take drugs. We don't take prescription drugs. We don't, it's very unusual for me to even take a Tylenol. You know, that's so rare. And so just to have all these things happening all at once just was made it hard. So it was very frustrating and disappointing that things were not going the way I had hoped they would go. I also learned a lesson I was watching other YouTube videos before my surgery just to get an idea of what to expect and I was also talking to a lot of women uh, at the RV park we were at, um, at the church, uh, just different, lots of different people and I, I was shocked, that's another emotion, I was shocked at how many women have had hysterectomies. I'm not going to open a can of worms here, but I did find out that the United States has a higher number of women getting hysterectomies than any other Western country in the world per capita. Hmm. Now, a lot of those women that I talked to were younger when they had it done. They maybe were 20 or even 30 years younger than I was. Um, they were just a lot of them bounced right back and 10 days later they were back at work and everything normal and I was like mm, okay well mm -hmm. <laughs> never compare yourself to someone else that's the lesson um, because everybody's different there are women who are my age who are going through this that have had a much rougher time than what I've been going through so don't compare yourself to anyone, no matter what in life. Don't compare because it just, you're always comparing your worst to their best. And that's never a wise thing. So don't do that. I've had to learn to pace myself better. The first week when we'd go out walking, I was walking so slow. We're talking like sloth movements. <laughs> I could not understand why my feet and my legs would not move and my brain was saying, go, just, just go, get moving. And I, and there was no connection there. And it was like, why can't I just, move a little faster. I mean, going over the speed bumps <laughs> here was pathetic. It was, I mean, it was like going over a mountain, you know. <laughs> baby steps. Oh my gosh, so. big baby, little baby steps. I, it was, yeah. And I mean, it got to the point where it was kind of funny. There were, there were several people in the RV park who knew my situation, knew about the surgery, knew I was supposed to be walking for exercise and to get the anesthesia and everything else worked out and that walking was supposed to be the best thing. And so they'd be outside at the same time and they'd see me walking and I was doing a little better. And they were like, wow, you're doing way better than yesterday. And I'm like, yay, because <laughs> I didn't feel it. But um, one day I did. I went outside like I thought, okay, I'm just going to walk slow again. No matter what I want to do, I'm probably just going to walk slow again. But 
I started out walking and I was like, whoa, I'm like almost to my normal pace. Not quite, but almost there. And I was really excited about that. And then we just kind of kept booking along and it got to a point where it's like, oh, okay. All right, can't do that anymore. <laughs> Gotta slow down again. So then the brain started telling slow down and then the legs and the feet finally listened to that. So I have had to learn to pace myself and not push myself so much. That's been hard because we are both very active people and it's just hard to be just laying around sometimes. Mm. One of the things that I was doing when I was having the dental work done, and we're talking crowns, I had a root canal, I mean, we just, we were having a lot of things done. I found this at Sprouts. Now I know I looked it up and you can find it online as well. It's called Ancient Nutrition Organic Super Greens. It alkalizes, which is very important when you have cancer, or if you suspect you have cancer, or to to prevent cancer. Your body needs to be an alkaline, an al how do you say that? Alkaline. Alkaline environment. And, um, and then the detox was for getting some of the drugs and things out of my system. So this has been what I've been doing now since I've had the surgery too. And I think this has been very helpful. I'm not, I'm not selling it, but I can put information about it down below in the, in the description and you can Go see if you can find it there. That powder also, I should mention, tastes pretty good. I, um, you can put it in a smoothie, you can put it in juice, you can do whatever you want. It has, I, I think, kind of a berry flavor in it because it has a lot of fruits in it, lots of fermented things in it. Um, it I think it tastes fine. It's very green. I've, I will warn you, <laughs> but the greens are the best part of it. And it also helps with digestion which some of the medications messed up too. So it just was a very good thing to be on. And I've got a couple of couple of these containers, that, these tubs, and I'm going to keep drinking it for a while. The second week, my, my pace has picked up. My tempo has picked up. Um, I'm walking more often outside. I, I still pace inside here back and forth. My eight steps back and forth <laughs> between two rooms. But I, I've been going more in the RV park around more and uh, being able to go farther. I think we did three quarter of a mile one day and then the next day I think we did even more than that. So that was really, I was very pleased with that. Considering that the heat here has been in the 90s, uh, yeah, we, we don't go out in the midday for sure. Uh, but it, but still uh, I still get somewhat tired and so or I should really say fatigued more mm -hmm. than anything so then I just come in and I I have to put my feet up for a while and uh, but I don't have to take a nap anymore like I was the first week I haven't had any real pain to speak of after the anesthesia worked its way out of my shoulder areas and everything where it had been so painful I stopped taking the pain pain meds and all I was on was just regular strength Tylenol I was or or ibuprofen I wasn't taking a prescription strength uh, either of those and I was taking those until that was gone and then I thought well I'm just gonna see how I do and for a couple of days I had just this achy feeling in my abdomen it wasn't painful it was just achy so what were you telling me that you reminded me of all the things that they had done to me? Well, they have just these little incisions in four different places with equipment inserted, messing around with everything in there just to try to isolate the uterus and the other parts that they were going to remove. Mm -hmm. So everything got kind of shook up and dislocated and had to find its way back to where it belonged. That's... It's the kind of pain that you don't necessarily feel as pain as much as discomfort. And yeah, and like I described yeah. as achy. Um, it's been over 20 years since I've had a menstrual cycle, but I remember the first day I would have to take Tylenol or something just to get the edge off. And 
it was like a duh moment. I thought, well, okay, it's not a menstrual cycle, but it's still something, that kind of a thing going on with it, my abdomen. So I started taking just in the morning and at night before going to bed. I didn't need anything during the day. It just was enough to keep the edge off and I was able to get through. And today I forgot to take it this morning and it's uh, late afternoon, so. She's still being nice to me. Yeah, I <laughs> probably will take some before I go to bed just to make sure I sleep okay. But otherwise, maybe I'm getting past that too. Yeah. So it's been two weeks, yeah. a little over. Another feeling we have been going through since we've been here is oppression. We are staying at an RV park that was very conveniently located just minutes from the hospital where I had my surgery. But it's in a very noisy part of town. Um, there are quite a few homeless people around. The We are in a gated community or we would not have stayed here. Right. Um, but we were out walking one day and I noticed there was barbed wire on the top of the fence and I thought, I didn't remember seeing that before, but it's been there. I just didn't notice it before. So you don't feel like you can go out of the park here, the RV park to walk further or have a different scenery. Uh, we did find out about a beautiful park about three miles from here that we hope to get to when this big heat dome leaves. Um, it's just a gorgeous park and that's where we're gonna probably be doing more of our walking. Hmm. But we're also looking at moving to a different RV park. So far we haven't been able to find any with any openings and we may end up having to go further out, maybe even like 45 minutes away from Houston to get away from the city noise. But it is something we're, we're considering. So, I mean, Gary, especially, you're yeah. used to, when he was on Corpus Christi, he would leave the RV park in the morning. He would go all over the place along with a guy who was 90 years old from the RV park and they would walk together sometimes. Well, until I, as long as I could keep up to him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was always going off yeah. somewhere else other than the RV park. But here we're pretty much confined to the RV park. And it's not just the homeless and crime possibilities, but heavy traffic. That um, has been the worst. It's, it's pretty steady, heavy traffic here. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the sidewalks are too close to the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have felt kind of trapped because I wasn't able to travel very far. I wasn't able to go places the first week um, or even this week as much. Uh, we did go for lunch yesterday and met a family relative that lives in Houston a ways away. Um, but she met us part way and we got to have lunch with them and, and that was nice. And uh, then afterwards we went to Whole Foods, a lot smaller than the HEB we showed you in our last mm -hmm. video. And uh, we were able to get a few groceries and came home and I didn't need a nap. So that was that was good, but it was such a nice, refreshing change to get away from this area. So if you are feeling like you're kind of trapped in your home or oppressed because you can't go anywhere or do anything, something that's been helping me a lot is reading books, which yeah. I've had for years, but I have never read them. I um, usually am busy with so many other things that I just don't look at the books, but it kind of helps to escape to another place. Mm -hmm. And um, Facebook and YouTube and things like that, those help too. Uh, but I don't want to be on my phone all the time. So it's nice to just have a little diversion or maybe have a hobby or something that you can do little um, easy hobbies that don't require a lot of physical strength or anything that um, you can do real easily. Those are some other suggestions you might want to consider if you're feeling kind of homebound. One emotion that I haven't heard anybody talk about 
after having a hysterectomy is grief. I, before my, my surgery, I was talking to different women and finding out that they'd had hysterectomies. I swear it's the best kept secret on the planet. And I would hear things like, oh, you're never going to miss it. Oh, you're going to be so glad it's gone. Oh, you'll feel so much better. You'll wish you'd done it sooner. And the one that kind of eh, zinged me was when somebody said, you don't need it anymore. Just physically speaking, the way everything is in there, they all help to support other things. So now all of that is gone. Not just my uterus, but the ovarian, the uh, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, everything. That's all gone. And so now things are going to have to shift into different places. And I've had people say, "Well, that's okay. You know, you'll get used to that." But the grief thing. Um, most of the women that I talk to, I don't remember anybody having an endometrial carcinoma diagnosis or possibility. We didn't know what I had for sure until I had the surgery and the pathology report, and I'll be sharing that in a minute. So most of them had hysterectomies because they had fibroids, they had heavy menstrual cycles, they just had a lot of um, discomfort every month. There was just a lot of complications for them. And so, yeah, for them, they did feel better. They, they did wish they'd done it sooner. They, they did go through those kinds of things. But nobody talked about losing their womb. I had four children grow in my womb. They were conceived in my womb. They grew in my womb. I felt the move in my womb. There was life inside me. And a lot of history, like you mentioned uh, when we were talking about it. You said that there's a lot of history there. And now they're all grown and have children of their own. But it just felt like a very important part of me is no longer there. Does anybody else feel that way? Am I the only one? I was beginning to think, wow. There was one woman that came close. She said that she didn't feel pretty after she had a hysterectomy. She felt like she'd lost all her femininity, the things that were special to a, being a woman. And um, so she went out and she went shopping and bought some pretty frilly feminine things. That isn't what I'm experiencing. I'm experiencing a loss of something that my babies grew in. And so that is kind of a different thing. And I'm just wondering if anybody else has felt that. It wasn't a sadness of or a fear of what they were going to find in the uterus when they took it out. It wasn't um, the fact that, you know, they... I was a little troubled about how they took everything. Granted, I'm too old to have children. I'm past those years. I'm 67 years old, but I just... I would have rather have had a baby than have had a hysterectomy. I'll say it right there hmm. at my age. I would have rather have had that than it would have been a much more rewarding thing. King David in Psalm 139 talked about how he was knit together in his mother's womb and he was fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's, it was just such a, I just always thought that was such a beautiful picture of what being pregnant is all about, of what, you know, being born, be, being growing inside your mother is all about. I just have always thought that was so special. And I went through it. I had it. It's not like I didn't. I mean, I had the children. I went through all of that. I had, I had went through the pregnancies, and, but it was just now it's all gone. That 
that part of me. So leave a comment down below. Is this a weird thing that I'm experiencing? Has anybody else ever felt this way about having a hysterectomy? Um, again, your reasons for having one may have been different than mine, but uh, maybe you had that feeling too. I don't know. I'm not obsessing about it. I am in this video. <laughs> um, it's the most I've really talked about it with anybody other than Gary. Uh, I'm not stressing over it. I'm not obsessing about it. I'm not um, going to dwell on it. I'm not laying around all day long depressed or anything like that. But it just is in the back of my head. Every once in a while it comes up. And so just wondering if anybody else has gone through anything like that. The pathology report came back this week. I haven't been dreading it. I haven't been overly concerned. I did have symptoms for a year and a half. I knew the mass inside my uterus was fairly large. In fact, when we got the actual measurements back from the pathology report, it took up most of my uterus. It was pretty big but the uterus is pretty small just saying <laughs> yeah. anyway the three things that I had been asking for all along from all of you was that it not be cancer if it was cancer that it would be contained to the uterus and all would be removed when I had the hysterectomy and that no further treatments were needed. So those are the three prayers I was praying for, and I knew hundreds of you have been praying for us. We've been getting text messages, emails, uh, private messages, comments on, the, our, um, on our videos, on our Facebook page. Uh, just a lot of you have been praying for us. So I knew I had a lot of prayer warriors out there, and plus, us praying and our kids praying everybody's been praying for us so that's been wonderful and so I just had faith that no matter what the outcome that God already knew and God's already ahead of it and he's gonna guide us through whatever comes my doctor at MD Anderson said she was concerned um, wondering how it was all gonna come out because it had been a year and a half of spotting off and on. Uh, so when we got the pathology report back, it's pretty good. Stage 1B. Stage 1. After a year and a half of symptoms. Now, not all women have symptoms with endometrial carcinoma. But I did for at least a year and a half. Don't know how long I had it before that, or if it was just all of a sudden that that, that was when it's developed. Stage one, B. The B is because it had started to go into the uterine lining, the wall, and um, but it did not go through. So because it didn't go through, it gets the B. So stage 1B, endometrial carcinoma. So it was confirmed that it was cancer. The cervix, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and the six lymph nodes that they took from that area down there all came back negative for cancer. So at this very moment, it's pretty safe to say that I am cancer free. However, <laughs> endometrial carcinoma can come back. And it'll come back in other organs. I only have one female organ down there left. So uh, that's the first place it would go. It can also go to other organs not even related to the re reproductive anything. So I'm just um, been told protocol 
that if I do nothing, it would be an 8 to 10 percent chance it would come back. I don't know where those numbers come from. I was looking all over on the internet trying to find what the odds would be for someone with stage 1 B endometrial carcinoma um, cancer coming back. And uh, the National Institute of Health, the NIH, uh, they said 2.3% to 9.2% or something like that. That's a lot lower, at least on the one end. Um, where they come up with the numbers, I don't know. Where do they come up with these odds? Am I being thrown into all women who've had stage 1B endometrial carcinoma? 60 to 85% of women who are obese get endometrial carcinoma. So after they have their surgery, do they continue with their lifestyle? Do they continue to eat the way they were before? Do they do things proactively to prevent getting cancer again? Am I in that number? That's what I want to know. So we're meeting with a, a radiologist oncologist next week so that we can find out more information. We know there is something called a targeted radiation treatment. It's targeted to the vagina cuff. And what I don't understand is how treating, how zapping that with radiation is going to prevent anything else from happening. And guess what? There is no guarantee. I asked her about that. I said, when she told me that, I said, okay, so what, so if I have the treatments, then I'm free and clear, I'll never get it back again? No. It only reduces it by half. So we have a lot of questions. I've been writing down a lot of things. Gary and I have been talking about it a lot. We've been talking to other people who we trust with our health a lot, um, getting different opinions from different people. You don't, they don't know. This is from the American Cancer Society website. They said that they don't know what the long-term effects can be from having the radiation. And it can take sometimes months or years before those side effects appear or complications. So we have a lot of things to think about, a lot of things to be praying about. Hmm. We're praying for wisdom and discernment. That's what we need from you now. We need prayers for wisdom and discernment to know what we should do. Like I said, we'll know more next week. We'll get gather more information next week. But um, I've had people say, "Get it done, do it." It's just it's a guarantee that you know it'll be great, and, and you won't you won't have any problems. You'll be fine. And I'm, but they don't. It's it they you, they don't know what the long term is, because nobody does. So we're gonna explore that, and we will let you know what we decide to do. It doesn't mean I'm not going to do anything. Just to clarify, medicine is not always, or medical treatments are not always the answer. We have always been very careful about avoiding cancer. We've always done everything we can think of, but we're still learning and we're still learning more and more ways that we can do things naturally without the side effects.
So I'm looking into those options as well. So next week, we will hopefully be in a different location or we're going to be leaving this park a lot and going other places <laughs> to walk. The people in the park are nice. We've met some very nice people here, but a lot of them have left now. And uh, new, more people will come in. We'll see. But um, as of right now, we're hoping to get into a different place. And we'll have information from the radiology oncologist. We'll have all of that. So we'll share all of that with you later. Is there anything you want to say more? Just that the reports have all come back highly in our favor. And we're very grateful for the way the Lord is blessing the efforts of those who are taking care of Orlean. And uh, appreciate your prayers as well. And trust that as we go forward, that the same Lord is going to take care of us wherever it leads. And uh, right now, it's looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. And we're anticipating even getting back to our home grounds, if you want to call them that. Family, where family is, back in family. Wisconsin, a little yeah. faster, uh, depending on our decision. Mm -hmm. But as of right now, my post-op is scheduled for the end of June, instead of the middle of July, like it was. I, it was way past the six-week thing, and I... So she moved it up. She said, that's too long. You don't need to wait. We don't need to have you wait that long. So we'll get out of some of this heat, maybe. Well, Just in time to get back to Wisconsin for their heat. <laughs> it's that time of year. Yeah. Thank you again for all your love and support and prayers and encouragement and uh, your comments. Um, it's, it's, oh my gosh, there's a lot of women going through a lot, lot, lot worse than what I am. And, uh, a lot of people to pray for man um all over the world i'm getting people from from the uk um other provinces in canada now uh and uh one was from i think australia so women all over the world have these questions <laughs> about hysterectomies evidently but we'll try to keep as many of you in our prayers as we can as well mm -hmm. Yeah, our list is <laughs> very long. Subscribe if you haven't yet. Next to it, after you subscribe, there's a little bell that pops up, and you'll see the bell. If you ring the bell, tap it, and then uh, hit all, and then you'll get notified every time new videos come up. Check out our Facebook page for other things and other updates. And until next time, God, God bless. bless.